Okay, it's two o'clock. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Martin Reedman. I'm a co-director of the New York Integrated Food Safety Center of Excellence, which is funded by the CDC, who is bringing you this, this webinar on investigating and preventing foodborne disease outbreaks linked to raw milk and raw milk dairy products. Um, before I get started, I want to thank Paula, Andy, and Stephen for um, help and input on the slides. There are probably some others that helped too that I may have forgotten about. And I want to also thank the, the states that are part of the New York COE area who have sort of suggested this. And the suggestion really started during COVID when at least some states appeared to see more raw milk related outbreaks and, and issues and figured that it would be, and this would be an important topic. Um, a little bit, bit, bit for background, I'm actually a veterinarian by training um, with a subsequent PhD in food safety. So I sort of I'm familiar with the, with the field of particular dairy-related foodborne um, disease, diseases, all the way from primary production to um, transmission through foods to the, to the human side. And I've, we spent quite a bit of work over the last 25 years to really look at many of these foodborne pathogens at anything from animal feed all, all the way to, to food and human disease outbreaks. So this topic I thought was very, um, timely when it was suggested, but I think it got even more timely over the last two to three months as we experience a severe shortage of, of infant formula. And, and to illustrate that, I, I wanna show you a, an email that was shared with us um, that starts with all parents and that um, you may not believe came from a raw milk producer that advertised to parents that goat milk is a healthy alternative to formula. The milk is tested and inspected twice a month by New York State Department of Ag and Markets. And no middlemen. Photo of friend's son who, due to formula, started on a short goat milk and is thriving. Loves the milk. Available at our raw goat milk dairy. Um, I don't think this is the only one that's trying to capitalize on that. I don't know how many parents, how many desperate parents are taking taking up some of these alternatives, but I think it illustrates that this is a topic that is, was important when it was adjusted and is maybe even more important today. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna start out with sort of an overview of food point illness burdens and dairy products, talk a little bit specific about raw milk outbreaks with some um, case studies, um, then talk about raw milk consumption, why is this happening to help us get some ideas of how to prevent this rather than you know, chasing outbreaks, move to other um, dairy, raw milk dairy products, and then find it, finally sort of few hints and ideas of how to investigate outbreaks and hopefully some useful ideas for you there if you, if you are in that situation where you need to investigate a raw milk outbreak. Um, if you look at food bond disease burden, I mean, there, there are a number of papers out there, um, but one, one interesting thing that always struck me is when you, when you look at them is, the dairy products always accounted for a high number proportion of, of food borne illnesses. Large numbers, most hospitalization, um, second most death, et cetera. So dairy always came, came up high. Um, wide range of organisms associated with dairy, and including some pathogens really predominantly associated with raw milk and raw milk dairy products. And um, Priscilla and Campylobacter and E. coli and Salmonella are some of the big ones. You know, some of the other ones like Listeria may be associated with raw milk, but could also be associated with um, pasteurized products. And um, when you look in more detail, and as taken out of this, this paper, that's also a little bit dated, but I don't think much has changed. And with regard to specifically um, foodborne disease outbreaks and disease linked to raw and unpasteurized dairy product, the stats are pretty staggering. You know, they're, the, their best estimates are the non-pasteurized products are about 150 times more likely to cause disease outbreaks as compared to pasteurized product. Um, disproportionately affect people less than 20 years old. And an important one, that if you have states that actually restrict the sales of non-pasteurized products, they tend to have fewer outbreaks. So, these are the overall numbers. If you look at number of outbreaks, black is unpasteurized, white is pasteurized. So you can see for most years and overall, the majority of 
um, food fund disease outbreaks linked to dairy products are really caused by unpasteurized products. So this is a this is a substantial issue. It's not just a niche issue. And um, this shows the legal status of non-pasteurized dairy product sale or distribution. Again, an older slide, but the picture is changing. I think relatively frequently, I would say, where states pass different and new legislations. So it, it, what it really illustrates is, is that, that many states, most states allow permit product sale of, of unpasteurized dairy product and pasteurized milk. Um, but if you specifically for US state, you really need to check what's the current status. And, and we've been contacted over the last few years from a number of states where there were some concerns about legislators wanting to change um, to make it easier to sell unpasteurized milk, et cetera. So I know some of these states have probably been flipped since then and the status has changed. Um, if you look at the um, food bond disease outbreaks linked to non-pasteurized product, the majority of outbreaks, not surprising, are caused by either raw fluid milk or raw milk cheeses. If you look at the primary suspects, that's the one I mentioned before. If you look at the number of you know, outbreaks, Campylobacter number one, Salmonella number two. So these are outbreaks specifically linked to non-pasteurized products. Sugar toxin producing E. coli number three, and then Listeria and, and surprisingly Brucella. And we'll get back to Brucella a little bit, bit later on that. Obviously sort of an you know, ancient organism that, that's been linked to dairy products. In, in the good old days, but I think may come surprise to some of, of you that, that it still is an issue, even in the US. Internationally, wouldn't be a surprise in some countries, but even in the US. Um, so let's talk about what these foodborne um, illness cases and outbreaks linked to raw milk look like. Um, I'm gonna start out with, with a slide that shows you know, the frequency and how common these different key pathogens are found in, in raw milk. These are all US data. And, and it, it illustrates that it's not that surprising that we see outbreaks. If you look at Listeria, you know, more than 5% of milk samples almost consistently positive for Listeria monocytogenous. Salmonella, also substantial numbers. You know, some on the low end, it might be one to 2% positive, but on the high end, you know, 15%, 12%, so more than 10% positive. Campy, fewer studies, Yersinia intercolitica, E. coli 0157, fewer, but other STECs also pretty frequently found. Now, I highlighted one key thing here, and I'll get, come back to that, is that idea of filters. And what you can see, some of the high numbers, high prevalences for listeria is from filters. If you see for salmonella, you have a in this study, they found 1% prevalence in milk, but 12.6 in milk filters. 11% in milk, 66% in milk filters. So milk filters, also known as milk socks, like literally the socks that you wear on your pants, on your pants, um, are used to filter out, they're not, they're not really a filter, they're re re really used to sort of catch, I would say, larger particulate matter straw, larger pieces of dirt, junk, etc. cetera. Um, they are essentially in every milk pipeline before the milk goes into the large container that gets picked up on the farm. And it is a great tool to determine and test a system to see whether pathogens are found in the system, much more sensitive than testing the actual milk. So if you do outbreak investigations and go on the farm, definitely try to collect the milk filter will be one of my pieces of advice from this. And, and this table really suggests and supports why um, that would be a good idea. Um, here's an example of the outbreak, and I'm gonna sort of somewhat randomly walk through a few of them. Um, this is an E. coli outbreak in California, linked to raw milk. And, and they always end up very similar, you know, multiple people infected, some, Sometimes all report drinking unpasteurized milk. You know, sometimes it's organic, sometimes it's not. Um, typically match, you know, matched by PFGE. Another common theme with, with some of these raw milk rate outbreaks theme is that we we ta often talking about repeat offenders in terms of the, the sources. 
And if you look at this farm and this farm, organic pastures is well known by, by a number of people, by many, many of you probably too, for having multiple issues and run-ins. Um, yeah, had a recall after Campy was found before in 2012, had a recall because Campy was found. Um, had some cases previously um, and had to recall not just raw milk, but also raw cream and raw butter. Um, sometimes, you know, raw butter is not linked to that many cases because it's probably not that common, but it is another vehicle that could, could transmit this. So, so Campylobacter and, and larger Campylobacter outbreaks are, are, are probably are one of the most common issues with, with raw milk. Um, but it's not just Campy. We've had listeria outbreaks, um, raw milk from a Pennsylvania organic dairy. And, and sometimes these, these cases don't just occur in the county or in the state where the organic milk is distributed, whether it's you know, visitors or whether it's people. Milk is actually moved across state lines and, and, and we can talk about that more later, um, could contribute to that. Um, another example, um, another uh, campy example, and, and it can get bad. I mean, this is an example of a campy outbreak that um, was at some point reported to reach 80 illnesses, mainly Pennsylvania, not a Pennsylvania dairy, but also in some of the close by states. Um, and, and then for Pennsylvania, and, and, and I apologize in the beginning that I would sort of throw Pennsylvania under the bus, has, has a history of, of raw milk dairies and, and outbreaks. So, this one reported, this was at 2012, so over the preceding five years, um, seven outbreaks, 287 illnesses. And this outbreak, old, and Campylobacter is obviously important because it's not just causing mild gastrointestinal illness, but also guillain barre syndrome. So also more severe long-term sequelae. Um, this is sort of another look at, at this outbreak um, in Pennsylvania. So um, again, it's, 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 these are very, very typical outbreaks. And an important point here is, is that while there are in many states different types of requirements in terms of testing for raw milk dairies, um, that does not assure that these dairies do not cause outbreaks. Okay. This one ultimately um, had 148 associated cases. And again, if you have questions in the, in the discussion at the end of this, we can talk more about these, some of these Pennsylvania outbreaks. So, but it's not just champion, it's even more unusual organism. I mean, here's an example of a raw goat milk outbreak. Cryptosporidiasis, so, so crypto can be transmitted by raw milk. So the, the agents that can be transmitted through raw milk are actually pretty broad. We haven't, Yersinia is another potential organism that could be transmitted through raw milk. And, and then we have what, what I'm gonna call sort of re-emerging pathogens of concern. Um, Q fever, um, Coxiella burnettii, it's not eradicated in the US. It would not surprise me if you we were to see um, Q fever, small Q fever um, outbreaks linked to raw milk, mycobacterium tuberculosis, and Prusella. Um, Prusella outbreaks in the US domestically acquired um, have been linked to the live attenuated vaccine. So this is a vaccine that is used to vaccinate cattle, RB51. It is a live organism that has some mutations that reduce its ability to cause disease in animals. But if consumed by humans that are susceptible, this attenuated strain will still cause disease. And, and we're gonna show a little bit more data on this one. With regard to mycobacterium tuberculosis, there, there are a number of states in the US that um, occasionally experience bovine tuberculosis cases in, in cattle. Um, many of them have been in, in beef cattle, but there have been some in dairy cattle. In addition to the states um, surrounding Yellowstone, which obviously is, a, is an issue for because of exposure to, to bison transmitted TB, we also see a number of cases. Regularly, um, cases pop up in Michigan where there seems to be an endemic situation in, in deer. So, and again, not 
wouldn't be too surprised if at some point this does not jump over into milk. And if it's in the wrong herd and raw milk is consumed, could cause a uh, human case. Um, this is a little bit more on the um, RB51 outbreak linked to consumption of raw milk um, from Pennsylvania, um, somewhat more recent, 2017, 2018. In this case, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Ag in their traceback investigation actually found cows that tested positive for RB51, um, was detected by PCR in um, bulk tank samples of our samples from a single cow whole genome sequencing um, identified two different strains. One matched the 2018 New York patient. One matched the 2017 New Jersey patient. So this WGS and Epi pretty convincingly linked to, to, to raw milk. So, so this is the picture we see. Um, questions often we often get is like, how can we work more proactively to to prevent um, these outbreaks? How can we do more education about the the cons of raw milk consumption? And I want to provide a few thoughts on this. Um, and and there's sort of what I consider the the standard um, answer and the standard education that we get that's that's captured in this pediatrics. Um, article and and a small excerpt from them is basically talks about you know pro, the proponents of health benefits of raw or unpasteurized milk and milk products. They claim that pasteurization destroys important nutrients, blah blah blah. And then it says all of this is anecdotes and numerous scientific studies show that them that pasteurized milk contain equivalent levels of nutrients compared with raw milk and raw milk products. Now. This always has rubbed me a little bit the wrong way because it's not quite correct. And, and there was a study that actually did, in my mind, a better job, which is a more systematic review that actually does point out that there is a lower number of a few vitamins in pasteurized milk as compared to raw milk, specifically B1, B2, C, and folate. Now. No one drinks milk to get the daily recommended dose of B1, B2, C, and fo fo folate, right? You don't drink milk to get vitamin C. So technically, scientifically speaking, yes, some of the vitamins in are reduced in pasteurized milk relative to raw milk. Practically speaking, it is not relevant. Now, the problem is, is if we talk to people and, and say there's no effect on any nutrient values, and we're simplifying things to a point where we could actually be proven wrong when we when we communicate like this. So that's why I'm throwing this up. So I would be careful if someone tells you, no, it's, I read it and science says that raw milk has actually some vitamins at higher levels than pasteurized milk. They're actually right. Um, this study also you know, showed that there was a protective association with raw milk consumption and allergy development, but they correctly point out that this relationship may be confounded by other farming related factors. Essentially what they're saying here is like, it's very hard to separate out who's drinking raw milk and who just lives on a farm in a high allergen environment and the potential impact that might have on development of asthma. Um, if you want to work in your individual states um, with regard to outreach and education, um, there are some very good um, videos, and some of you, many of you may be aware of this, on the CDC webpage on what they call real stories and dangers of raw milk. Um, so these are these are real people that got sick um, and, and have these videos. So you might want to use some of those um, as a resource. Now, food safety risks associated with raw and unpasteurized and dairy products is not just raw milk. Often we, we sort of immediately jump to raw milk, but I want to talk a little bit about the issues associated with raw milk and, and raw milk cheeses, which are really other major category of, of food and illness linked to unpasteurized dairy products. So 
Raw milk cheese is, 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 is not as simple as it might seem. Cheese is a very broad category. Think of you know, mozzarella, fresh cheese, to Limburger, to two-year-old or older age Parmesan. These are very, very different products. They're very, very different in their characteristics, their pH, how much they support microbial growth, et cetera, et cetera. In the US, and this is not regulated at the state level, but that's regulated at the federal level, we are, raw milk cheeses are legal. And many of you may know this, but some of you are not. But they are only legal if it's cheeses that require aging for 60 days or longer. Essentially, every day that has as a requirement must be aged 60 days or longer. So cheddar cheese will be one, could be made as a raw milk cheese legally and sold across state borders, okay? The idea obviously is that if you age cheese for long, the exposure to the low pH, other antimicrobial factors, reduces foodborne pathogens to a level where the cheese is sufficient, it could, should be considered safe. The problem is that's not true for all cheeses or pathogens. In addition to these legally made cheeses, Illegally made raw milk cheeses are also an issue. And, and the classic example there would be fresh and Hispanic style cheeses, which are not, don't have to be aged for 60 days. They cannot be made from raw milk, but sometimes they are. They could be illegally imported, which, which sometimes could be linked to Procella, for example, and some other pathogens, or they could be illegally made in the US. Similarly, cheese curds could not, cannot be made and sold across state borders from raw milk because they are not aged for 60 days. So that's another potential vehicle for some of these cheese related outbreaks. So both legally and illegally made raw milk cheeses are a concern in this area. Um, this illustrates the challenge. This is a study that looks at survival of 0157 in cheddar cheese aged for 60 days and basically says, shows that 60 day aging period is inadequate to eliminate E. coli during cheese ripening. So E. coli will survive in those cheeses, particularly an issue if it starts out at somewhat higher levels in the cheese or in the raw milk. And that's true for a number of other pathogens. Um, another key challenge and, and a key issue are soft ripened cheeses. But I want you to think there, there if you're not sort of in that you know, sort of a cheese connoisseur or expert is think your, your, your basic brie cheese, camembert cheese, the cheese that has white fluffy stuff on top of it and it's soft inside, okay? These cheeses can be made as raw milk cheeses legally, but this risk assessment suggests that they're more than a hundred times more likely to cause foodborne illness if they're made from raw milk cheese, raw milk as compared to make from pasteurized cheese from pasteurized milk. So raw milk, camembert and brie, much more likely to cause human disease as compared to pasteurized milk cheeses, even though they are legal. Key issues there, EHEC, in addition to you know, your salmonella and listeria. Um, another cheese that is somewhat of a higher risk is, is Gouda cheese that will show up, raw milk Gouda cheeses will show up more frequently. As, as an issue because the acidity in the Gouda because the way it is made is not as high as in some, some other cheeses. So, so when you have some outbreaks, potentially raw milk, I would always sort of think, you know, Gouda Hispanic style cheeses, soft cheeses are the ones that I focus on as high risk. Um, here's an example, an E. coli 0103. So remind that's not just 0157. Um, linked to um, an outbreak, three people, six small outbreak, cheese legally produced aged more than 60 days. Now, as we all know, these pathogens are not just found in raw milk cheeses, right? I mean, there have been plenty of listeria outbreaks um, linked to pasteurized milk cheeses, which if you try to do outreach on the risks of raw milk cheeses will typically be thrown in your face to say that raw that pasteurized milk cheeses cause more outbreaks than raw milk cheeses, which which may be true because they consume more. 
the denominator is different. It doesn't, but raw milk cheeses are definitely, particularly again, these soft ones, substantially more risky than cheeses made from pasteurized milk. Um, other raw milk products um, that are less commonly linked to foodborne illness outbreaks is will be raw milk ice cream. We don't see much of that, but I'd be interested in uh, panel commenting whether I've seen some of that. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but it's less common. Raw milk yogurt would be very low risk because it is much more acidic, has a much lower pH than cheese. So these pathogens die off pretty effectively, even though they could survive, you know, over time in, in some of them in yogurt, but shorter time and they kill us pretty effectively. Sour cream pathogens would survive, buttermilk they would survive. So all of these are products that show some risk but not the same level of risk as a, as a pasteurized milk. Um, butter, we talked about it. If it is made with raw milk, also is, is risky. Um, it, it does, many organisms will not grow in butter, but they will survive. So that's particular in an issue with regard to salmonella and E. coli. Listeria, probably somewhat less of an issue because it's less likely to grow, but there have been listeria outbreaks linked to butter, but pasteurized butter, so not a zero risk product. So all the things to, to ask about. So if you have an outbreak as part of the food history, um, you might wanna ask about butter obtained from farms, butter that may be made from raw milk. Often people may not know whether it was made from raw milk. So now let's, let's move to the last part and talk about investigating outbreaks linked to raw milk and raw milk dairy products. Um, so a few things that, that that, that I wanna mention here. Um, let's start off with patient interviews. Um, in many cases in patient interviews, the patients may be reluctant to report that they consumed raw milk. Some may be aware that they received the milk illegally. Some of them might wanna protect the farm they obtained the milk from because they know that farm sold the milk illegally. When you do these patient interviews, you need to be aware of some unique practices for acquiring raw milk. Um, cow sharing, which is in states where you're not allowed to sell raw milk, you're still allowed to drink raw milk from your own cow. So the way around these, these regulations will be to buy part of a cow, so I can go to a farmer and say, can I own one quarter of that cow and therefore get one quarter of the milk of this cow and consume it. And now the farmer is not selling me milk technically, but I'm drinking milk from my own cow that this farm is just housing for me, for example. Would also be a way to sell raw milk in a state that allows for raw milk sales, but the farm might not be permitted or might not want to be permitted. Distribution schemes into bigger cities can be very interesting. And maybe we'd get Casey to tell us some stories about what they've seen in New York City, how raw milk makes it into New York City. Um, raw milk might be sold as pet food, which is, as far as I understand, not illegal, but obviously sold as pet food with a, with a wink. People know that often it's, it's humans that consume it. So all of that is something you might wanna consider in your patient interviews. Patients may often not be aware that they consumed raw milk or raw milk dairy products, particularly with butter, cheeses, but then also if you have smaller children, um, sometimes exposure may have happened at a visit to a neighbor, to a relative, et cetera. They drank raw milk, they don't know it was raw milk. It is not just cow milk, but also sheep and goats, so keep that in mind. Um, when you talk to your patients, try to determine whether raw milk or raw milk dairy products are still in their possession. Collect them for testing, obviously. In some states, it appears that farms that sell raw milk may be required to maintain a log of customers. That can be useful, particularly once you identify as suspect farms to get um, additional potential people that were exposed to look for additional um, illness cases. Um, this shows you some of the, the sort of distribution pathways. So um, Andy shared this webpage. So this is a webpage to the Other Milk Creamery Association. 
Um, and it shows you the almost religion, um, raw milk is for some people. And, and they say, the main reason we are here for you is that there's no more milk left in the store. And their premise is all milk has been tampered with, even organic milk makes people sick, it's pasteurized, homogenized, ultra pasteurized, synthetic vitamins are added, it's just the worst. And the only way around it is to buy raw milk from their private members club. All right? So this is, this is the way and some of the ways this, this milk, uh, raw milk is distributed and acquired. Um, trace back to a farm. Um, many consumers, many patients may not know the name or may not willing to um, give it up. Um, remember in some states, store sales of raw milk are allowed. You need to know and understand your state regulations to, to see where and how the raw milk could have been distributed. Um, as you plan for your trace back, make sure you contact your state animal health or state ag departments about raw milk issues permitting to get a better understanding how this works. And these relationships are generally very, very important as you do trace back, as you go into farms. Um, it's not unusual to have this, this the good number of raw milk um, isolates of pathogens, Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli, in the whole genome sequence database, such as NCBI pathogen detection. And Sometimes your first indication of a raw milk outbreak might be that a um, human isolate closely matches to a raw milk isolate. That's no proof that it's a raw milk related or a raw milk dairy product related outbreak, but it, it points you into a direction um, that, that might be useful as you do in your um, questionnaires. Um, sometimes the type of pathogen subtype that you find um, might be indicative of an outbreak linked to, to dairy animals or to, to cattle. Um, textbook example might be Salmonella Dublin. Um, if you have a Salmonella Dublin outbreak, you know, the likelihood of an exposure from um, cattle is high because it's a, a subtype that is a serotype that's adapted to cattle essentially. Um, on farm investigations. Again, as we mentioned before, collaboration with the appropriate departments is important. Collecting with it as a history of animal disease can be helpful. Um, we just dealt with a firm that had not a, was not linked to an outbreak, but contamination events. And when we started to ask some questions, they're like, oh yeah, one of our cows had circling disease. Circling disease is the, the, the sort of common name used by livestock people for listeriosis because the animals literally run around in circles. These affect the central nervous system. This one is often linked to poor quality silage. So often we look for poor quality silage. So you may want to collect milk samples from animals that in the past showed symptoms. In this case, actually that cow that three, four years ago had listeriosis, we took her milk samples and lo and behold, we found listeria monocytogenous in the milk from that animal. Um, sometimes we go back and actually even collect silage samples. Finding Listeria monocytogen in silage doesn't mean the farm is responsible for an outbreak, but once you have whole genome sequence data and subtyping data, it can provide you with evidence that if the subtype found in silage is the same or similar as to the one that's found in, in human patients. Remember that Salmonella, E. coli, and Listeria infection in cattle may be asymptomatic particularly in adult animals. Um, I sometimes recommend to collect even fecal samples from calves because if a salmonella is found in the herd, it might be easier to find it and pick it up from the calves. Again, that then gives you isolate that you could use for subtyping. In many cases, obviously a good idea to enlist the help of a veterinarian in these investigations. If you move to on-farm sampling, we already talked about a few things. Um, the obvious samples, obviously, first are going to be the bulk tank milk. That's the large tank where the milk is stored before it's picked up. My recommendation is agitate the milk before you collect the samples. The infamous, what I mentioned, milk sock or milk filter. Um, you could go to milk samples from individual animals. If you have 
you know, any specific evidence that implicate certain animals, either current or previous symptoms, for example. Uh, if you have multiple animals, you could consider composite samples. So yeah, you can take milk samples from five or 10 cows, put it into one sample and test that one. Environmental samples, again, based on our experience, we've in, in at least a few cases found matching subtypes in the raw milk and in environmental samples collected from the milking parlors, such as floor mat. And I'll show you some pictures of that. Fecal samples, feed samples, before you go out, make sure you have a lab that can do the appropriate tests. You know, crypto testing from milk samples, from environmental samples is not necessarily trivial. So you really need to make sure your lab is prepared. And if your lab in your state can't do it, you have an idea where to send these samples to. So here are some pictures of, of, of samples. So this is a milk sock. It's, it's a pretty long sock here, and, and you can see sort of particular matter, particular matter in there. Another picture of a milk sock. This is silage. And when we collect silage, and which we specific in cases of listeriosis, often you focus on the top areas on the corners where air comes in, and therefore the silage starts to rot rather than ferment properly. And if you have baled silage like this here, again, sort of the poor quality silage is a good one to collect. Again, might be helpful to have a veterinarian or someone who knows this stuff out there with you if, if you're not experienced with that. But once again, we've had examples where we found matching subtypes from these types of silage samples and the raw milk established that could establish a link even if you don't necessarily find the same subtype as responsible for an outbreak in the milk itself. Um, this is what I'm talking about, uh, milking parlor samples. So what you see here is some of these floor mats. So this would be a typical milking parlor. Here's the milking employees. Here's the mats they have. Here are the cows. And often the cows in that part of the milking parlor are also standing on floor mats. These floor mats tend to be very difficult to clean and sanitize and often are not taken out and completely cleaned and sanitized. Again, had examples where we found the same salmonella as was found in raw milk on these floor mats weeks, if not months, after we found the milk positive. Pretty well establishing that the salmonella was introduced on the farm side. Whether it was from the milk per se or from the environment of the farm is a, is a different question. But these are good samples to collect. This is when you do a farm investigation why you want to go out and have some sponges with you. Don't just have containers to collect milk. Also have some sponges and obviously have some bags with you where you could put that milk sock in. So in summary, um, when you investigate raw milk poop on disease outbreaks, make sure you understand the raw milk sales regulations in your state. What is the picture there? Know the pathogens including the manifestations and niches in cattle and dairy farms. And so know if you have a Salmonella Dublin outbreak linked to raw milk, know which animals are most likely infected, what symptoms they have. In this case, you might wanna go with calves and test calves. It might be a different story if you have Salmonella sero, which is a different sub subtype of Salmonella. So, so having the right people that understand animal disease can be very important and that's obviously your veterinarian, your state veterinarian, if possible. Understand the details of raw milk dairy products and their risk profiles. That's particularly important if you have outbreaks that might be linked to cheeses and raw milk cheeses. Very often, um, facilities make different types of raw milk cheeses. A company might make a very high risk raw milk cheese. Let's take our brie cheese, but might also make a very low risk raw milk cheese. Let's say, uh, you know, one year age cheddar. Understand that your chance of finding listeria is much better in your soft cheese. Understand that the, the likelihood of that soft cheese causing the disease is much higher than a hard cheese that's aged for a long time. Keep that consideration when you do the sampling of cheeses, for example. Be prepared with some of the unique challenges of sample collection on farms. You know, the farmers might not always be 100% collaborative. They, they sometimes speak a different language. If you talk about, do you have a filter in your milk? I guarantee you some farms like, we don't have a filter in our milk. We don't filter, in our, filter our milk. But if you ask for the milk sock, 
they will help you find that milk sock or they have no choice but giving you the milk sock and helping you how to find. So you need to speak the right language. Again, having a veterinarian with you can be very helpful there. On the patient interview side, it might not always be easy to get all possible sources and the information on these farms. This is, I'm gonna call it a cult in some cases that tries to protect the people that are part of it. And then that's something we just need to be honest and, and clear on and aware of. And then finally, we talked a little bit about prevention. Uh, you know, it requires, I think it requires balanced communication. We, we can't ignore that people believe their health benefits and, and we can't ignore the fact that, yeah, there are some vitamins that are found in lower levels in raw milk. As I mentioned it, it's practically irrelevant because milk is not a good source of those vitamins, but it's still there. In many cases, you might reach out to your local land grant universities or, or us to help you. Um, it, state health departments can be in a very tricky situation. You know, you, you really can't typically lobby your legislator to not legalize raw milk sales or not make raw milk sales e easier. We don't lobby, but we can be maybe a little bit more on the convincing side in terms of really um, presenting the potential issues with it and be a little bit more forceful in how we communicate that. And we have done this in the past where we went to um, legislators and, and talked about the dangers of raw milk consumption and, and providing examples. So it is one way of how we can help in addition to you know, some of the other things. So that's what I had. So at this point, I wanna A, open it up for questions. So the best thing would be if you can type any question into the Q&A box, and you can also add comments um, that we can then address and discuss. I wanna do this not just as a sort of Q&A, but also sort of more of a panel discussion. Here are the people that we have on our panel, I'm Andy Newman. She's a, the state public health veterinarian um, for New York State Department of Health. So this would be her or the equivalent would be an important person to have involved in, in some of these raw milk and unpasteurized dairy product um, outbreak investigations. Casey McHugh is a New York State Ag and Markets, the Division of Milk Control. has been involved in some of those um, outbreak investigation. Stephen Combs from the Maine Department of Health one of the groups that alerted us to some raw milk outbreaks, if I'm not mistaken, and, and brought up the importance of maybe doing some, something like this webinar. And then Kelly Klein with, with the infamous Pennsylvania, um, which obviously had its share of um, raw milk related outbreaks and, and cases. So as we wait for questions, I might just sort of go through my panel and ask, all of you to maybe point out things where I'm, I might, where you disagree with me and um, add some, some color to it, add some of your experiences, maybe even talk about an outbreak or two that you investigated where you might be able to provide some helpful tips. So Andy, would you be willing to start us off with a few comments? Sure, um, thank you, Martin. And, um, and thanks for uh, folks for joining us today. Um, it, indeed, Martin got at some of the challenges of raw milk outbreaks, especially um, sort of the the um, the complete uh, disinterest in dealing with government officials, um, as is displayed by some of the folks who are um, who may either be ill um, due to consuming one of the raw milk products or may have purchased a product, um, and um, when you know when the local health department or whoever reaches out to them to advise them to um, discard it, they may end up being completely uncooperative. Um, excuse me, my dogs are playing now. Very inconvenient, very inconvenient. Um, in any case, so that is, those are some of the biggest challenges. Um, and, you know, it, it is something that, um, fortunately we're in New York, we have good communications with our uh, colleagues at, um, the Department of Agriculture and Markets, Casey McHugh and his group. And I can't emphasize enough that if you don't have those relationships established already, uh, this is the time to go ahead and do it. Casey, any comments?
Thanks so much. Uh, great to see a lot of familiar names out there too. And then Martin's slides take you through so many different uh, years, experiences. Uh, I'm going to start with kind of the the cow share or the uh, behind the scenes hidden website that the, the products have this undercover stealth delivery on certain days in the church parking lot. I mean, there's a lot of that that is extremely difficult, especially for us, New York City metro region. Um, you know, we'll get a complaint and uh, some of them you you set up a sting and then it completely goes dark where you could see before where the drop off locations were and you know, we had one, I'm not going to mention any names, uh, got some colleagues on here, I don't need to throw any rocks, but, you know, we had one where it was, the milk was sourced in one state, the distributor was coming through another, there was also USDA was involved because of illegal meat distribution, so as part of the investigation, we're going through Google Maps, and the uh, Google car drove by while they're transferring milk between two delivery vehicles. So the, the street view shows us everything we needed to see as to what location was in part of, you know, part of the distribution system. So, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to stop there. But uh, great job, Martin. And uh, you captured a lot of it. I guess on the farm side, I would say this. Uh, just because you see the perfect clean farm with a picket fence and, and the whitewashed walls that that's not going to be a source of contamination. And then you go to another farm that sanitation practices may look rough. Uh, the, the, those farms never pop a pathogen. So it's such an interesting dynamic of getting into the environmentals. Yes, you're going to find positive. <laughs> pathogens in, in the dairy farm environment, but it's, uh, you start linking them up and uh, it, it gets very interesting to see some of those case studies. Martin, I don't know if you want to talk about the very rare scenario of the, the campy uh, that was traced back to one quarter of a single cow at a raw milk permitted facility. That's a good one. That is, a, that is a good one. Yeah, Martin, before you begin, um, Casey, you brought up the two things that I was thinking about. One, one thing about that interstate um, milk sales is not only did the Google uh, car catch it as it was mapping out the area, but it also showed that the trucks that were doing the delivery, some of them um, did not appear to have any sort of refrigeration in them, uh, really further compounding the problem. Um, and then, yeah, Martin, if you want to mention that um, the, the cow and then the um, I just remember that outbreak um, because everybody said, you know, you're nuts to go looking for that cow. You're never going to find it. But uh, Martin, if you if you want to talk about that one, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think either you or Casey might have more details. So why don't you um, give us the, the story on that one? I don't know which of you wants to do it. Uh, I, I can start, certainly. So this was a, um, a producer here in New York, uh, League, uh, permitted. Um, and when there was an outbreak of campy that was associated with consumption of products from that farm, and we, we did have cases, if I recall, we definitely had cases. Um, they, uh, this farmer was very cooperative, um, sent over, faxed over their log, uh, customer log, which uh, is something that the Department of Agriculture and Markets requires that they keep a log of all customers who purchase milk on the premises. And while there were some gaps in it, it was a pretty good log, I have to say. Uh, but this farmer really, really wanted to go and get at the heart of the matter, so to speak, um, and uh, tested um, I don't know how many cattle they tested. I don't know if it was a random sample or not, but they were able to isolate uh, Campylobacter from one quarter of a cow that, um, you know, in the lab seemed to match up with the outbreak strains. I don't know, Casey, if you have more details on this. This goes back uh, 2008, 2009, no. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, no, you nailed it. It was just such a unique scenario to be able to drill down. We had never had that it was, you know, almost to the mastitic quarter of a single animal as cause of the outbreak. And just one kind of quirky, you know, when we in New York only, when we get a presumptive positive, we uh, notify 
the uh, permit holder and ask them if they would stop selling and doesn't always uh, happen that they respond in the affirmative, believe it or not. And, and that's a very frustrating thing just because we don't have a positive yet. It's not confirmed, but we want folks to be able to make an educated decision on, on that. And it's quite interesting when folks say, no, I'm not going to stop. And I don't know how that plays out in a court of law if people are ill or, or worst case scenario pass, but it's, it's definitely an interesting uh, uh tidbit of information that, that we discuss around the campfire, I guess. I'm, that's all for me, Martin. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Casey. Stephen, any any thoughts, anything you would like to add or correct in terms of what I said? Sure. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, I think a lot of the stuff you covered is really applicable to um, what Maine is, uh, Maine's experience has been that it's really important to know who the partners are that you're working with, uh, know the uh, capabilities of the laboratories that you're working with, um, and also just try to really handle this in the most um, diplomatic way as possible, because we have had uh, plenty of, of um, situations where passions are pretty uh, high and, and people get very intense about this sort of stuff. We have had to release uh, press releases for calls for cases associated with raw milk outbreaks. And that uh, has to be done kind of delicately and keeping in mind uh, the cooperation of the of the farm and and uh, but also trying to uh, find the scope and extent of the outbreak. Uh, we've had a couple of raw milk outbreaks that we've been really involved with in the last couple of years. Um, one was a crypto outbreak. It was a smaller one, and uh, another one was a large Campylobacter outbreak from one of our neighboring states that we had a lot of Maine residents that that uh, became sick. So that's about it. Right, thanks. Kelly, um, wanna add your perspective and I see you, you claimed one of the questions. So if you wanna tag your response to that one on at the end, that would be great too. Sure, thanks. Um, so I do have a little bit of information about Pennsylvania since we are such an outlier in terms of raw milk outbreak. We actually sat down and calculated how many raw milk outbreaks we've investigated. And from 2005 to 2018, we had 44 raw milk outbreaks. Only 22 of those had raw milk as a confirmed source. Um, the other 22 were suspect and those tended to be smaller, were more likely to include a private farm. But our confirmed raw milk outbreaks actually represented 8% of foodborne outbreaks that we investigated during that time period. So it's a pretty big volume for us. Um, of some of those outbreaks, 32% uh, of them were multi-state. So while raw milk is illegal to transport across state lines, we are aware that a lot of it is coming from Pennsylvania. 68% uh, of our confirmed outbreaks were from a licensed raw milk uh, farm. So the over half were known to have been permitted and had been in compliance. And four of them had more than one outbreak. They had repeat outbreaks during this time period. Um, so just kind of guess that one of the questions, why do we have high incidences in Pennsylvania? There could be some truth to it being driven by the Amish, but more than that, I would say, it's just that raw milk is legal. You can sell it on the farm, you could sell it in a farmer's market, you could sell it in a store if the store was going to assume liability. Uh, we have very loose raw milk regulations. It's easy to access it and it is actually, um, getting easier over time. We're actually loosening some of our regulations now. So moving forward, raw milk butter is going to be allowed. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. One in particular is just persistent lobbying from raw milk advocacy groups and um, 
you know, Pennsylvania is a heavy agricultural state. Raw milk, in addition to being important to people for some of the reasons that Martin got into, is also a really good way to make money if you were a dairy farm. Um, and so if that is like kind of the difference between you being in the black or in the red, it can be really important to your business that you be able to sell raw milk on the side. I can answer the second question just for Pennsylvania. I don't know if you want me to get into that. That would be great, yeah. So the second question is, and I know some states require routine testing of raw milk. Does this testing also typically include testing of milk socks, et cetera? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and say no, we do not uh, routinely test the milk socks. We, per our state regulations, we have five different kinds of testing that have to occur, and none of that includes milk socks. So would you mind if you, if you know what testing you do routinely? I think that might be of interest too. Sure. Um, so once a year by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, there needs to be testing for Salmonella, Listeria, Campylobacter, and Eftex. Those same four pathogens have to be tested twice a year by a certified lab, but paid for by the dairy. Uh, every month, there has to be a somatic cell count, and that also has to be with a third-party certified lab. Uh, and then twice a month with your certified third-party lab, you have to do uh, bacteria and coliform counts, and then finally you have uh, water supply testing, and that's for pathogens. Casey, um, milk socks. I don't think so. I don't, I'm not aware of any state doing it, but I mean, what does New York do, and, and are you aware of any states that do milk sock testing as part of the permitting am, process? Yeah, I am not aware of that, but it always is used as a great place to go to an indicator, whether it's mastitis or just a, a great cross section of what's going on at the facility. Um, and then just a little bit on New York. So we've got about 60 raw milk facilities. Uh, we differ uh, from Pennsylvania that we only allow on farm sales. Uh, we feel that strikes a balance between consumers seeing the facility and uh and producer being able to have direct contact with the with the consumer and uh you know have a discussion if they want to uh, and then we do every month an inspection and then we sample for standard plate count and somatic cell i don't know if everyone on here is familiar with somatic cell it's like basically white blood count for uh leukocytes it's, it's basically the herd health if you will and then quarterly Salmonella, LM, Campy, E. coli, 0157H7, and then staff is done quarterly for the New York facilities. I don't know, Stephen. Uh, the, only, and... the only other thing, uh, yeah, just one other thing that I wrote down earlier. Uh, the last information, if you want to look at it, things nationally, uh, National Association of State Departments of Agriculture did a 2011 survey of all the raw milk states, and I know there's been some changes. Georgia just made a change, uh, but that's a great place to go to get an idea for all of the different kind of uh, individual programs that are out there. Sorry to interrupt, Martin. No. Cool. Thank you. Stephen, Andy, any, any thoughts on the milk sock testing or anything different that you've heard or know? Maine doesn't do regular milk sock testing, so. Okay. I've got nothing to add beyond what Casey mentioned. Okay. Casey, another question for you. Who pays for all those pathogen tests, the farm or New York? So, uh, great question, Chuck. Uh, in New York, uh, the original screening sample uh, that has to be sent out, which includes a water sample, a milk sample and water sample for startup. That has to go to an outside lab. And then the monthly samples and uh, quarterly pathogen samples are sent to our New York State Food Lab at no cost to the permit holder. Oh. So we don't have any other questions currently, but I have a slight a slight addendum to that, Casey. Um, for my edification, I knew our testing was free 
Um, is there a fee to be permitted? Is it an annual fee? I'm just wondering if the state recoups that money in any way. Uh, we do not. Uh, our permits for uh, what we call a part two as per our part two regulations, uh, the processing permits, uh, which includes the raw milk permit, they are, uh, there's no cost associated. And they are good until revoked. So not too many states that can pull that one off. That's the way we're set up. We do have a participant who has his hand raised. I'm gonna allow him to talk. Sounds good. Brian, you can go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, uh, make a comment about we at Tuatagan Markets in New York, we also do uh, prior PFGE uh, subtyping and now whole genome sequencing of uh, any pathogens we find in, in raw milk. One of the interesting things, well, two, there's two interesting things that I observe routinely, and most of what we, we find are listeria monocytogenes, is that um, one, uh, often the raw milk is, is sort of like unique. It doesn't really appear much in the national pulse net or genome tracker databases. And if it does, the second point is, is that often you'll see it sort of cluster in the, this part of the country, the Northeast, uh, and maybe be some other like beef or other sources uh, associated with that. And I don't know if that's just sort of the small number that we, we have had over the years, or if that's just sort of associated with how the cattle uh, and dairy cows are moving around, uh, you know, from farm to farm potentially. Uh, but it's just something that we've seen with the sequencing and the, and the subtyping. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Um, don't have any other questions. So, um... To the panel, anyone there has any any questions or any sort of even just more broadly topics, additional topics that we should should cover or discuss? I've got nothing unless you want to go into the history of pasteurization, but I'm I'm thinking that um, <laughs> folks on this call probably know some of that. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I might might not not do the history lesson today. People didn't have a warning on that one. So yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Now I know. So that's why. Right, that's right. That, but thank you. Okay. Um. Anyone else? If not, I'm happy to keep this relatively short and sweet, and give you back some of everyone back some of their time. Um. Okay. Um. We will make this available if, if you can find it, um, email me or, or Paula, or any of us, where you will be able to, to find this recording. If any of you want the slides, again, feel free to email us and we will we'll be happily sharing the slides. If you wanna lift some, if you find them useful, that would be great. And in addition, the New York COE will also always be there to help you support you in your outbreak investigation. So if it's, whether it's raw milk or anything else, um, if you want support, let us know. We are here to help and and, and support you. Um, I don't know, Paula or Andy, my co-conspirators on this um, COE, whether you have any final words you want to add before we let everyone go. Okay, hearing. Okay, Paula. No, I think you hit the main. You hit the main point. Yep, I was just double muted. Um, you hit all the right points. Uh, thanks everyone who was able to join. It will be made available, the recording on our, our website. I think um, the slides will be sent out to those of you registered uh, and or the link to the where the slides are posted will be sent out. Uh, and obviously you can feel free to share the slide deck with colleagues and we're here. Um, reach out to us if you if you need anything, if you're in the New York COE region, if you're in a different region, um, of the of the U.S., you can reach out to your uh, applicable COE. Thanks, all. Thank you, and thank you, Andy, Casey, Stephen, and Kelly. Um, uh, I found it very very interesting. I learned a lot both preparing and, and hearing your comments, and I hope it was useful to others too. Thank you. <laughs>